Thank you. So, uh, my name is Szilárd Freifer. I uh, graduated uh, as an electrical engineer almost 20 years ago. Uh, since then, I have been working in IT security, so I'm not a typical an electrical engineer, but, but an ID guy. I started my career as a software developer. Now I am a security evangelist, as you can see on the slide. I work at uh, Balasis, uh, which is one of the few Hungarian IT security vendors. Uh, earlier, it was called Balabit. It was the vendor of the Syslog NG. Uh, now we are the uh, vendor of the Zorp application level firewall, which has a GPL version, open source one as you may know. Uh, this story has started with my pet project, uh, which is a cryptographic setting analyzer uh, called Cryptolyzer. The, the functionality is same as in the case of the t uh, SSL, the test age, SSL scan, or uh, SSLIs. Um, during the implementation, I realized that I have to implement the cryptographic part uh, of the uh, cryptographic handshake uh, to get some information uh, from the server. Uh, but I wanted to bypass or forge somehow uh, the cryptographic part because I am a lazy engineer and, and I don't want to care about the cryptography. So um, I also realized that it is possible to send uh, seemingly correct messages to the servers uh, which are accepted by them and answered by them. Uh, the question arises how this um, uh, leads to a denial of service attack. Uh, the answer is relatively simple. Uh, the messages I mentioned um, are simple, short, and preferably capable most of the times. So they are suitable to uh, cause significant load uh, on the server side because the client sh should not need to uh, calculate the messages uh, connection by connection. Uh, they, uh, it can pre-compute uh, pre it, and it can send repeatedly uh, to the servers. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to demonstrate how seriously um, affects uh, the cryptographic library a denial of service attack uh, like this. Uh, first of all, uh, let's see what is key exchange, uh, which, which, uh, why, um, what kind of key exchange exists and uh, why they are so important and why they are vulnerable to a denial of service attack. All cryptographic protocols have a uh, step during the cryptographic handshake called key exchange. What is it? Uh, if parties tend to communicate uh, with each other in a secure manner, they need a key, a shared secret, which is practically uh, some kind of random data which will be used during uh, the communication to encrypt and decrypt messages in a symmetric way. Uh, this uh, shared secret uh, have to be exchanged uh, without risking that the third party compromises. Uh, this is the key exchange part. Uh, there are some key exchange algorithms which can do that work. Um, why uh, these key exchange algorithms are um, exploitable to, the, to a DNIL service attack? Um, the reason is the fact that uh, they, they are CPU intensive, depending on the specific uh, key exchange algorithm. They are also unauthenticated, meaning that uh, in the cryptographic handshake, uh, the key exchange is before the authentication. So an unauthenticated client can uh, force the server to do something, to do CPU intensive operations. And the third thing is that the messages are, are uh, most of the times pre-computable. So uh, a client can uh, pre-compute all the messages uh, need to be sent to the server to to force them to do the CPU intensive part of the handshake. What kind of algorithms exist? First of all, I have to mention the elliptic curve version of the diffie hellman key exchange, uh, which is uh, considered the most secure and the most effective key exchange nowadays. It is still possible to use it to perform a denial of service attack, uh, but uh, it requires significant throughput, uh, which does not um, um, so it does not first the cost. The second uh, mentionable key exchange algorithm is the RSA, uh, which is an unbalanced uh, key exchange algorithm, meaning that it requires much more uh, CPU computation on the client side, uh, sorry, on the server side than on the client side. It makes it uh, ideal to perform a denial of service attack because the client needs to um, perform uh, less CPU computation than the server. But uh, it has to be mentioned that uh, the RSA key exchange algorithm is um, 
more effective um, and uh, less CPU intensive than the original Diffie Hellman key exchange algorithm. So uh, the last one is the original Diffie Hellman key exchange, uh, which requires much more CPU computation uh, than the all, all the earlier mentioned uh, key exchange algorithms. Uh, this algorithm is balanced meaning that it requires the same amount of CPU computation on the client and the server side. Uh, it would make um, it ineffective to perform a denial of service attack, except uh, you can decrease somehow um, the necessary uh, CPU computation on the client side. How, how it can be done? Uh, to, to, un to understand how we can decrease the CPU computation requirement on the client side, uh, I, I have to explain the DTM on key change uh, without uh, going into the details. Uh, the, the algorithm is balanced, as I mentioned, so the parties do the same operations, but on different numbers, as you can see on the slide. Uh, the only uh, CPU intensive operation is uh, the modular exponentiation. Both parties uh, do that uh, twice. Uh, they, when they compute the uh, public key, their own public key, this is the second step. And when they compute the shared secret, um, uh, this is the fifth step. In this way, uh, the computational capacity uh, requirement is, is the same uh, on the client and the server side, uh, which is not ideal if you want to perform the IO of service attack. Um, um, but in an ideal situation, an attacker can enforce the victim to do a uh, significant amount of CPU computation uh, without making the same on the client side. So the other car needs to cheat somehow this cryptographic protocol uh, to do that. It is possible because an other car uh, does not really want to uh, do the key exchange. It just wants to, to, to force the server to do the CPU intensive uh, part of the, the key exchange. So it can send whatever number uh, to the server which is accepted uh, by the server. That's the trick. First of all, the attacker should analyze the server to get the Diffie-Hellman parameters of the server, especially the prime number. Why is it important? Uh, because the attacker should pick a number A, which is less than the prime, because uh, it is guaranteed that the a result of the modular exponentiation, the CPU intensive thing, is less than the prime. So you have to pick a number A. After that, the attacker can send this A number to the server, and the server will accept it because uh, it cannot distinguish it uh, from a computed number. It is just a cheated number, it's just, just a randomly uh, picked one, but the, dist uh, the server cannot distinguish it uh, from a computed number. So uh, it will uh, do the uh, CPU intensive part uh, on the side. Um, af after that, the attacker should uh, receive the message uh, from the server to be sure that the server has already done the CPU intensive uh, computation. Um, uh, uh, with this mechanism, a malicious client can force the server to do the CPU intensive computation uh, on uh, its side uh, without doing the same thing uh, on the attacker's side. This is the day heat attack, uh, which is named after, um, uh, named after the fact that it can heat the CPU using or forcing the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The heat attack got a CVA number, uh, 2002, 2001. Uh, the first part of the CVA number is a date. Um, actually, it is 2002. Uh, it, this is a year number when the vulnerability uh, was exploited, that, but not the, uh, the year when the vulnerability was exploited for the first time, but the year when the vulnerability was first uh, published. Uh, usually this year number is the same in most of the cases, but in this case uh, there was a publication about the theoretical vulnerability in 2002. Uh, anyway, I, I uh, discovered that vulnerability independently from uh, that publication. There is a scoring uh, mechanism to prioritize the vulnerabilities uh, called Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS. The day heat attack gets uh, 7.5 as a score, which is a relatively high uh, score number, but the question arises, why is it not higher? The attack complexity is low. Uh, it, it's very simple to force uh, the server to do the CPU-intensive operation. 
Um, the attack requires no privilege at all, uh, and it requires no user interaction. But it does not affect the confidentiality and the integrity, so you cannot break uh, the uh, encryption algorithm by this way, uh, and it does not affect the scope, so you, you cannot uh, do uh, a privilege escalation using uh, this attack. It's a typical uh, denial of service attack, and practically, uh, denial of service attack cannot get a higher number than uh, 7.5. Anyway. CVS score is a unit to measure the uh, vulnerabilities impact on a software or on a cryptography protocol, uh, but it cannot measure uh, the, the, the impact on the real world uh, because it highly depends on um, how widespread is the vulnerable software or the vulnerable cryptography protocol. So I decided uh, to do a research to find out the prevalence of the DFIAM on key exchange in the case of web servers. First of all, I have to mention that the DFIAM on key exchange is completely secure. Uh, the OpenSSL offers it uh, even in the highest uh, security level, and Mozilla suggested uh, part, part of the, its um, configuration generator. As you can see on the slide, in the uh, top 100 uh, domains, uh, the uh, support of the DFIAM on key exchange is uh, extremely low. Uh, the reason may be uh, the fact that, that, that uh, there is a um, a performance issue with the DFIA monkey exchange, and uh, maybe the fact that uh, it is possible to provide backward compatibility with the older clients by using the RSA key exchange, which has no performance issue. In the case of the top um, 10,000 uh, domains, the uh, ratio of the support is 25%, uh, which is still so high, but if you see that, uh, if you can see uh, in the case of the one top the top 1 million servers, the ratio is 47%, which can be so uh, considered high. Uh, in general, we can say that there are more than uh, 55 million HTTPS servers on the internet, according to the uh, Shodan statistics. And if we assume that the ratio is the same as it was in the case of the top 1 million uh, domains, uh, we can say that more than 10 million servers using DFIA monkey exchange nowadays. After the theoretical explanation, let's, let's see a demo. I will use a DigitalOcean uh, instance with uh, four CPUs and eight gigabytes uh, of memory. I will use two kibibit uh, DFIAM on key size. I will use a Docker container uh, which, uh, which run uh, Apache Web Server uh, with the mentioned two kibibit key size. I uh, implemented an application called Day Heater. It's named after the attack, which is Day Heat, um, uh, which, can, which is a um, um, proof of constant implementation uh, of the uh, vulnerability. Uh, let's start it. But not in this terminal, but the other one. Mm -hmm. Demo effect. Okay, it has started. And as you can see, the CPU, uh, uh, there is 100% uh, uh, CPU usage. Let's measure uh, the attack. I start the uh, TCP dump, or I hope so, okay. Okay, it has started. Let's wait just a few seconds. One, two, three, four, five, okay. Let's see the result. If I can stop it. What's, okay. I stop the attack. Okay, and let's see the result. Hmm. 
see, yeah, that's okay. Okay, it was uh, 17 seconds, almost 18 seconds. As you can see, the uh, incoming data, outgoing data, the number of uh, client hello messages was more than uh, uh, 5,000. All the public keys were unique. And as you can see, um, 77 requests per second uh, was enough to cause 100 CPU usage on one CPU core. Uh, so, as you see in the demo, relatively low throughput was enough to cause 100% uh, uh, CPU usage. Uh, but we can uh, we can question that that um, how. So is it, a, is it a high or is it a low uh, uh, throughput? Um, I have to say that it depends. If we uh, consider the fact that Cloudflare has mitigated a 15 million requests per second uh, denial of service attack last month, we can say that it's a relatively uh, low throughput. Uh, but let's go back to the reality and the demo environment and, and uh, let's uh, compare the values if we use different version of OpenSSL uh, or TLS and different key sizes. Uh, as you can see on the slide, if you use OpenSSL version 1.1 and TLS version 1.2, there are significant uh, differences in, in bandwidth and throughput. If we use eight kibibit key size instead of two kibibit key size. Uh, it's not a surprise. Uh, lar the, the larger is the key size, the better is the attack et effectiveness, as would expect it. If you use uh, OpenSSL version uh, 3.0, which is the latest version of OpenSSL, and TLS version 1.3, uh, the result is significantly uh, different as it was in the case of uh, TLS 1.2 and OpenSSL 1.1. Um, uh, uh, if you use the uh, e uh, uh, 8 kibibit key size, only 1.2 requests per second was enough to cause 100 CPU usage on, on a CPU core. Uh, the reason uh, could be uh, a performance issue in the case of OpenSSL 3.0, but it's just a speculation at that point. To prove that, I decided to measure the attack effectiveness um, with uh, different cryptographic uh, libraries and different key sizes to see how crypto libraries affect a denial of service attack. Uh, before I started to measure, I wanted to know how important is the key size. Is it true that the mo most popular key size is the two kibibit key size? Um, the answer is it depends. Uh, I measured the, uh, the key sizes in the case of the, the uh, web servers in the top million uh, domain which support the DPM on key exchange. As you can see on the slide, the two kibibit key size is uh, definitely the uh, most popular one. The vast majority of the servers use that key size. Um, one kibibit key size is still uh, so high considering the fact that the logjam attack states that it is vulnerable uh, by a nation state. Uh, a four kibit key size is uh, relatively uh, high, uh, but um, it was a surprise for me that it is low as uh, you can see. So therefore, uh, we could say that I have to focus on two kibibit key size, but um, I have to mention something. In the case of the TLS 1.2 protocol, originally it was uh, only possible to use one key size, but there is an extension in the TLS version 1.2 which makes it possible to a client to choose between kits key sizes in the case of DFM on key exchange. This extension uh, is part of the um, TLS 1.3 uh, protocol uh, definition. However, unlike the less popular uh, cryptographic libraries, OpenSSL 1.1 does not support uh, the extension in TLS 1.2 and does not support the DFM on key exchange at all in TLS 1.3. Um, this is the case uh, if we are talking about TLS, but DayHeat is a protocol independent attack. Uh, you can use that attack uh, in whatever protocol. Uh, so let's see what, uh, what we can uh, measure in the case of SSH, for instance. Uh, at the first glance, it may seem that the situation is uh, the same as it uh, was in the case of the TLS, uh, according to the Shodan statistics. 
Uh, the two gigabit key size is the most popular one, but the four and eight gigabit key sizes uh, are supported in more than 60% uh, of the servers, uh, which is so high. So we can say that e gigabit key size uh, can be uh, indeed uh, be forced in 60% in, uh, of the servers. And uh, there, is a, uh, there is an important thing I have to mention, that the SSH uh, protocol, uh, just like the TLS 1.2 with the extension and the TLS 1.3, allows the client to uh, choose between the key sizes. So an attacker can force the server to use the largest key size, which is enabled in the server configuration. Um, this is the variadic uh, uh, column in, uh, in the, on the chart. So presumably more than 90% uh, uh, of the servers can be forced to use the AKB with key size as it is enabled in the default configuration of the OpenSSH for instance. So the key size matters, especially in theory because uh, the attack effectiveness uh, highly depends on the key size, uh, moreover not linearly but logarithmically. However, it should be noted that uh, some more components are uh, important, uh, such as the uh, application uh, uh, server implementation and the protocol. So, I decided to measure, um, so I decided to perform some measurement. I wanted to focus on the cryptographic libraries. So, uh, and I wanted to exclude as many other factors as possible. I used the same environment that I used in the demo. And, I, and to avoid to measure the details of the application servers instead of the details of the cryptographic library, I have to find an application server which supports uh, more than one cryptographic libraries. Um, this is the light HTTPD uh, because it supports several cryptographic libraries, uh, not only OpenSSL, uh, which is the most popular uh, cryptographic library, but also GNU TLS, uh, which is another um, uh, popular cryptographic library, uh, NSS, uh, which is the cryptographic library of Firefox, and Embedded TLS, which is a, uh, an embedded system uh, cryptographic library. Uh, let's see the result of the measurement. What we can see on the slide, uh, we can see how much throughput is necessary to cause 100 uh, CPU usage on the server. This is the vertical axis. Uh, and the horizontal axis is the Diffie-Hellman key size. Uh, not surprisingly, the larger is the key size, the lower is the necessary throughput, which can cause 100 uh, person CPU usage. As the uh, computing capacity requirement is higher uh, with the larger key sizes, so a server can respond uh, fewer requests. Uh, the chart can demonstrate uh, that there are significant differences between the cryptographic libraries. Uh, in the case of uh, NSS, it was uh, uh, 150 requests per second uh, was, was enough uh, to, to cause 100% CPU usage with two qubit key size. In the case of embed TLS, slightly more than 50 requests per second was enough to, uh, to, to cause the same result. In the case of the GNU TLS, less than uh, 100 requests per second throughput was enough to cause this 100% uh, uh, CPU usage. What is the conclusion? The shape of the curve is, uh, is uh, similar independently from the cryptographic library. However, the exact values uh, demonstrate that there are significant differences in the um, effectiveness in the case of the different cryptographic libraries. The next measurement shows the differences between the TLS version 1.2 and the TLS version 1.3. Solid lines are uh, TLS 1.2 and dashed lines are TLS 1.3. Uh, as you can see, TLS 1.3 uh, is significant, in the case of TLS 1.3, significantly lower throughput was enough to cause uh, uh, the 100 person CPU usage as it was in the case of TLS 1.2. The reason is the fact that in the case of TLS 1.3, uh, the client is required to send uh, its public key uh, uh, during the handshake in the initial message. Uh, the result is uh, the fact that after the server receives this, is this uh, initial message, it, it can compute its public key and also the shared secret, so it can um, do the uh, CPU-intensive operation, the modular exponentiation, twice. 
uh, meaning that um, uh, that is causing that the fewer requests uh, is enough to cause 100% uh, CPU usage. At this point, I, I decided to uh, use a, a different unit of measurement uh, to, to make the different throughput values comparable with each other and to make uh, the different vo uh, the values comes from different environments and use different application servers comparable with each other. This chart uh, uh, displays the same data as the last one, uh, but with a different unit of measurement. Um, the star point is always one, and the lines are increasing because the points show, uh, the points show how many times less throughput was enough to cause the 100% uh, CPU usage using a larger key size than using a smaller one. Uh, the vertical axis is not linear, but uh, logarithmical, as the values uh, are also logarithmical. The curves demonstrate the autoc effectiveness. It's not throughput, it's autoc effectiveness. As you can see on the chart, the autoc effectiveness can be twice using uh, three kibibit key size uh, compared to two kibibit key size. It can be um, five times higher using four kibibit key size uh, compared to the two kibibit key size, and it can be uh, up to uh, 40 times higher if you use uh, eight kibibit key size instead of two kibibit key size. So, as you can see, um, increasing uh, the key size increases the attack uh, effectiveness dramatically. You might notice that uh, data about the uh, most popular cryptographic library, OpenSSL, has not a bit yet. It's not, not, an, uh, not a coincident. The red line demonstrates the attack effectiveness in the case of OpenSSL version 1.1 with TLS version 1.2. And as you can see, there are some oddities on the chart. Uh, in the case of uh, three and four uh, kibibit key sizes, the shape of the curve uh, is the same as it was in the case of other cryptographic libraries, but in the case of the uh, uh, six qubit key size, the attack effectiveness is much lower uh, than as it was in the case of three qubit si key size. As, uh, and um, it is also lower, uh, the attack, attack effectiveness is also lower than, than it was in the case of two qubit key size, which is quite surprising. Um, in the case of eight qubit key size, the attack effectiveness is almost the same as it was in the case of three qubit key size, which is qu quite strange for me. At that point, I uh, decided to uh, measure the OpenSSL by changing only one component at a time to find out what, what is the reason of that uh, anomaly. The result was most, most, more, seri uh, most, uh, more uh, mysterious than the uh, original measurement. I started the investigation uh, with OpenSSL version 1.1, TLS version 1.2, but uh, I used different application servers. The result, um, uh, the red line shows the result, and the result is the same uh, in the case of the different application servers, so the anomaly is independent from the application server. So I uh, decided to continue the investigation uh, by using um, the TLS version 1.3 um, with OpenSSL version 3.0. Only OpenSSL version 3.0 supports the Fiamman key exchange. So that's why I changed the OpenSSL version. Uh, as the blue line show, the result is the same as it was in the case of the other cryptographic libraries and, uh, and there is no anomaly. So I continued the investigation by using OpenSSL version 1.1, TLS version 1.2, but I changed the Diffie-Hellman parameters to random ones. Uh, I used uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, uh, parameter which comes from the uh, another RFC and then the random one. Uh, and as you, ca as you can see, as the gray line shows, the result was similar to the other cryptographic libraries again, and there is no anomaly. So I continued the investigation with the OpenSSL speed tool, which uh, measures just the Diffie-Hellman um, key generation, not the whole key exchange, just a key generation, and, and the solid and dashed white line shows the result is similar to the other cryptographic libraries and there is no anomaly. So uh, the anomaly exists only uh, with OpenSSL version 1.1, TLS version 1.2, uh, 
at the, at the, uh, at with, with the um, finite wheel diffie Hellman ephemeral uh, parameters. Uh, it is not fully clear for me uh, what is the reason of that anomaly, but I'm going to uh, continue the investigation. Anyway, the developers of the OpenSSL know about that uh, anomaly, and they said it's strange. So let me know if you have an answer. Why, why, what's the reason of that anomaly? To sum up my presentation, let's see what properties uh, makes the cryptography protocols uh, more exposed uh, to the um, day heat attack. First of all, I have to mention the zero round trip. Um, if it is necessary uh, to send only one message to a server to f uh, force them to do the CPU intensive operations, uh, the cryptographic pro protocol is uh, more vulnerable. This is the case uh, if you are talking about TLS um, and IKE. The, in the case of SSH, um, the client is required to, s uh, required to send at least two or three messages uh, to force the server. Uh, another important aspect is uh, the client, client key size selection possibility, uh, as I mentioned. This is the case uh, in the case of TLS 1.2 uh, with an extension, in the case of TLS 1.3, uh, in the case of SSH and IKE. Uh, the third thing is the uh, pre-computational uh, ability. If, if the client can uh, pre-compute the messages, the attack effectiveness is a little bit higher. But I have to mention, if it is not possible, uh, the attack effectiveness is a little bit lower, but it cannot mitigate the attack itself. Uh, you can pre-compute the messages in the case of TLS, uh, and uh, SSH uh, in one cases, but uh, in the case of uh, open SSH, you have to uh, compute uh, the messages uh, connection to connection. Um, in, in the case of some cryptographic protocols, there is a mechanism to uh, protect against the uh, denial of service attack. This is called cookie. Cookie is just a random number. Uh, the server sends the, this random uh, number to the client, and the client uh, should repeat it uh, and send it back to the server. In this way, uh, you can decrease the effectiveness of the, of the attack as you can, as you should um, compute uh, the messages connection by connection, uh, but it cannot mitigate uh, the attack at, at, at all. It can decrease the effectiveness a little bit, but it cannot uh, mitigate it. So uh, what method can uh, a user use to, to, to mitigate the day heat attack? If you are talking about private services, I would suggest to disable the diffie Hamon key exchange, and, and that, that's the solution. The elliptic version of uh, the diffie Hamon key exchange is the most effective one uh, nowadays and the most secure one. So um, if you are talking about private, uh, private services, it, it can be done. Uh, if the backward compatibility is, uh, is a must, uh, in that case, I would suggest uh, to control the number of unauthenticated uh, uh, connections. Unfortunately, there are just a few application servers which support that. A very good example for that is the OpenSSH, where it is possible to uh, control the number of unauthenticated connections. Um, so you can, uh, co you can set a maximum number of unauthenticated connections, and it can uh, decrease uh, the effectiveness of, of the uh, attack. Another possibility is use uh, a third-party tool uh, such as fail to bomb, uh, which can parse uh, the IP address of a malicious uh, client from the log messages. Um, and after that, it can create uh, firewall rules to bomb that client. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very effective uh, way uh, to mitigate uh, this uh, attack, but unfortunately, the default log level is uh, not enough in several cases. So if uh, you have to uh, increase the log level, which may mean uh, that it causes significant amount of log messages. Uh, so you have to care about that. If we are talking about public services, um, I would say that you have to consider the compatibility with uh, five to 10 years uh, clients. I mean that the uh, most browsers uh, support the elliptical version of DFIA Monkey Exchange for five to 10 years. Other kind of clients also support the elliptic curve version of DFI Monkey Exchange for five years. Um, and uh, in, the, in, in the case of the uh, public services, uh, you can also use the rate limiting, uh, um, 
using the application uh, server specific configuration or using the uh, mentioned failed one. Um, on the GitHub page of the application, they hit there, you can find configuration snippets, how to configure, how to disable the DFI monkey exchange in the different uh, application servers, and how to rate limit uh, the number of concurrent uh, connections. Uh, this QR code contains the URL of that uh, GitHub page uh, where you can find the uh, mentioned configurations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Silad. Uh, do we have any comment or for Silad? Any questions for Silad at this time? Take a photograph of the QR for future reference if you have something later. Here's a question. Thank you. Have you done any measurements on the elliptic curve DHE and how, how much better is the performance there? Uh, yes, um, I have done. Um, there, are sig there are significant differences. I mean, um, the elliptic curve uh, version of the TFI Amon is, uh, so you, you need at, at, at least uh, um, up to 10 uh, uh, throughputs to cause the, the, same, uh, the same results. So in, in my humble opinion, the elliptic curve version of the DFI Amon is not, not so good if you want to perform uh, denial of service attack, but it highly depends on the curve anyway. So there are uh, the, uh, several different curves. And if you use uh, a curve which uh, has a, a larger key size, it can be, it can be suitable to, to cause uh, significant load on the server. And uh, there is another um, important aspect, the post-quantum cryptography, uh, which can be useful to, useful? If it is useful. Uh, so it can be useful if you want to, uh, uh, to do or deny a service attack, but, uh, but I have to measure it. Anybody with any question for Silard? Looks not, so once again, Silard, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.